Hi everyone, you're listening on the background Tidy's latest single I thought that was enough but on this occasion instead of me uh, just introducing the artist and, and making uh, some commentary about it I thought I would bring the artist on the studio himself so we have Tyson or Tidy Hello Hi, Hi thanks Thank for making you. thanks for making time uh, you're in Australia right now aren't you? Yes, I am. Thank you for having me. I appreciate. It. I appreciate uh, you coming here. It's a it's a warm 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 morning in the south of England here. So I'm not sure what oh. the weather is like over there. It's funny. Um, I live in Australia at the moment, and it's uh, it's warm. 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 Uh, but yeah, uh, it's it's nothing like I guess it's nothing like Canada during the winter. Yeah. Uh, so for for those who are listening on the audio version of the podcast, you can go on odyssey.com and uh, uh, watch the video as well. Tide uh, tie is on camera there, but we're going to continue the the interview, and you're going we're going to discuss uh, a lot of. Uh, stuff about his career, but also some personal issues that will come a little bit later. I'm going to make an intro for those who may not know of you. Well, you know, we, we get new listeners all the time that just started listening to dance music and they may not have heard of you. But for those who are seasoned listeners and have been listening at least for the past 10 years, I'm sure they know you. You're quite famous. You're one of Australia's top exports, I guess. Um, just to make a very short uh, intro, you've been signed in uh, Army Van Buren's Armada label when you were very young, like 17 years old. You've been voted number one Australian DJ in 2008, 2009. Um, you have six albums released. Uh, your fourth album, Redefined, reached number one, uh, number four, I think, in USA iTunes, uh, number five in Australia. Um, loads of accolades there, redefined also, it was uh, Sirius XM Electro's number one song of 2015 um, and also received the number one dancer play record in the USA on that year, so you know, you're, you're, you're quite famous, you, you know, you've made it um, but oh, you. <laughs> but uh, why don't you make some have intro I, yourself? Have I made it? Have, I don't know, I don't know what, what the definition is of making it, but uh I'm well, very, very grateful. Well, being you know, when you're 17, being signed to Armada's Ar Army Van Buren's record label is is just I can't even imagine. You know, at that at that age myself, I was just dancing as a raver in in fields. You know, uh, listening. You know, in the early 90s. But so I can't imagine how it would be to be signed up with uh, Army Van Buren's major label. It was quite wild. Uh, yeah, I, I, but, but it was a goal of mine. I, I, I think when I was around 15 or 16, uh, I, I really wanted to have some releases on Armada. So I spent a lot of time annoying them on email mm -hmm. and, send, and sending my music. I actually remember them saying no to a lot of songs. And then one of those songs that they said no to was called Meet Me in Kyoto. And I got an email back and it was from one of the staff members at Armada. And he said, hey, M Marcus Schultz wants to put this on his album. Wow. Uh, on, on his mix album. So that's how it started. Wow. Uh, this is what I'm saying. <laughs> Um, yeah, not not many seventeen year olds have this sort of uh, you know meteoric career rise, right? And you continued um, looking back at your career. I think you released your first track in two thousand seven. It was called Familiar Streets. It was a trance record. Then you continued, obviously, with Meeting Kyoto, uh, as you said, and you have six albums. The last one being Collide, and on top of that, you have multiple collaborations. So I could. Um, I could see that you remixed uh, Neo, Steve Aoki's Neon Future in 2015. You collaborated yeah. with Borges. You've uh, remixed a trans collection for Ministry of Sound. 
So um, one of those annual mixes that they do, collaborated with Matt Fax with BT, which is Brian Tran's show. Uh, and you even remixed Share. Am I correct? Yeah. How was that? How how did this happen? Or, um. So I was. So I'm signed with Universal Music. Uh huh. Um. Published. Published with them. And from memory, I was just sent an email saying, "Would you like to remix a Share song? Because we think that you would be able to." do something interesting with it. And I was excited to do it. Obviously. So, yeah, it was yeah. very simple. I, said, I, 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 I just went, yep, I'm going to do that. And, fantastic. Uh, fantastic. Yeah. Uh, and uh, this year you have released three or four tracks, I think, uh, songs. Uh, Firefall, Just Believe, Tear Me Down, and the one we, we, we listened at the very beginning, I thought it was enough. Um, so um you're becoming your your sound to me is quite you know you incorporate always vocals am i correct is this is this how you work yeah i'm definitely a a vocal i i would say that my, well it's it's obvious that most of my songs have vocals mm -hmm. and the reason for that is that i i have always been when I grew up, I was into rock bands and, and like emo punk bands mm -hmm. kind of thing. And uh, vocals were always just a huge part of telling a story. Yeah. So for me, for, it's great to have instrumentals. And I do have a lot of instrumentals that are there. But I, I really enjoy the process of playing piano and having someone sing the lyrics and writing those lyrics and writing the story. I love, I love telling a story through lyrics. Mm -hmm. Well, you're almost a professional musician. I think you have some degree from... I'm older. <laughs> Well, so you are you are professional. Well, you're, you're professional. Sorry, <laughs> uh, you have a degree, don't you? Yes. 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 So, you, so you are. I yeah. A, a bachelor. I have a bachelor's degree in music and music technology. Yeah. So, uh, well, it, I guess, I guess for for those listeners who know of your music, and if you don't know, please go and listen to some of uh, Tidy's music. You you can you can hear that this is not just random. I guess FL preset uh, studio um, you know tracks that there's a lot of musicianship there as you said the vocals uh, play quite a lot um, a big role I guess uh, when I listen to uh, some of your albums Collide was the one that was quite musical to me am I would you share this opinion y yes Collide was the biggest the biggest undertaking I've ever done with an album. Um, I have to give credit to my dear friend, Christopher Tim. Mm -hmm. uh, he's, he's a two times Grammy award winning composer. And so the story of Collide is that when I was, when I was in university, when I was studying there, I would of, often hear people playing instruments and whether it was jazz or, you know, any genre really, you know, I would walk through the hallways at university and hear people playing cello and violins and, and I was a drummer myself and learning piano. So uh, it was always a dream of mine to make music that uh, incorporated an orchestra. And so later in life, I, you know, I didn't want to hold back. I needed to make that dream come true. So I approached um, Christopher Tin, and he's such a lovely person. And I spoke to him about making a song together, and it turned into an album. But uh, the, the really cool thing about Collide is, I mean, it's in the name. It's a collision of electronic music with, I guess, an entire orchestral section. Yeah. And so... Uh, we we work together on making that project yeah and it's it's it i would say it's like like underrated in the sense that 
I mean, it, it did well. It like it, it charted in the Billboard charts for both classical and orchestral. Wow. So, so both classical and dance mm-hmm. at the same at the same time. So having a song chart as both classical and dance at the same time is very strange. Yeah, because very those, rare. Or, those, or, those audiences are very detached. They're very, you know, you either listen to classical music or dance music. Some people cross both, but the majority are, you know, it's very, it's a very separate thing. So to push those two genres together was a uh, something that I felt was just wild and. I wanted to do it. It was experimental and um, working with Christopher Tin, it just taught me so much about how to go about making classical music as well. And, you know, I I gotta be careful with the words classical because Christopher Tin is a genius and he really can write anything in any genre. Um, But he was, you know, he's very humble and he was interested in how, like my sound design and how I mix songs and, and how I make the electronic side of things. And I was very interested in how Christine does such wonderful composition in the classical realm. So it made sense for us to work together. And I think we found some synergy that was just, uh, yeah, it's, you, you you know it, was, it just really worked. It it was definitely an album where where he would have an idea classically, and then I would then listen to it and do the electronic part. But then I would also send him a classical idea, or I was I I shouldn't use the word classical. I'm gonna be careful. But I would do something that was orchestral. Yes. And I would send it to him and he would say, that's really cool. Let me add to that. Let's work on that. And then we'd work on that together. And then I would produce it into an electronic way. And I think that discovery process was really incredible to be able to work out. You know, it, it, It's very hard to have a dance track where the bass line is so thick and the kick drum is taking up so much space. And then to have an orchestra, like a whole orchestra on top of that, it, it's very difficult. So we, we found a way to make it work so that it was like, like A, B, A, B in a way. Like, so it was like classical, orchestral, and then it would switch into electronic, and then it would switch back to orchestral, and then at the end, the two genres would meet. And um, I think we really did something that no one had done before at that time yes it's a very mature album i must say um and you know in in my opinion it's my favorite of yours even though this is a dance music podcast and you know i favor it i favor dance music a lot but uh, i can i can see the effort of the musicianship that was put there um for for that and you're right that was not very popular um in 2018 um, right now, I'm pretty sure you know. Th- I'm pretty sure you know that Pete Tong is doing a lot of this sort of stuff, where basically he does reprises of uh, the old classics, the Beta classics, with uh, a live orchestra, uh, at least in England. And uh, even the other day, I saw some drum and bass artists for making some kind of classical um, orchestration of their own, you know, old Array. jungle arrangements yeah 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 so you know it, it, it may become a thing and uh, um i can't remember who else did this before but um anyway we'll, we'll move on from that and mm-hmm. i want to obviously we said that uh you know you're an accomplished dj and electronic dance music artist and we brought you in for that but also there is a personal story that we brought you in to discuss here and uh, that has to do with uh, the pandemic and what has been happening for the past two years and some medical interventions uh, that were suggested or proposed as a, as a way of uh, preventing that disease. Um, and, um, 
an injury that happened to you? Am I correct? Is it a vaccine induced injury? Yeah, so it's a, this is a very difficult topic because um, I have never had any previous health conditions um, and I'm not an anti-vaxxer and I'm not, I'm pro-science. I, I love the scientific method. I think that that is the best way to navigate through life but uh but uh in my instance i did have some issues when i took the vaccine um you know i got i was paralyzed for a while and then the doctors told me that it was for a different reason and then they told me to get the second one i got the second one and it happened again and i was sent back to hospital so yeah, it was it was tough, but I think that the bigger point here is that it it's hard to blame it's hard to blame a vaccine or any medication if people can't speak up. And the issue that I have here in Australia is that doctors are not always able to be honest because they're fearful of losing their registration. So um, how do I say this, I guess? Well, I, I could have been very unlucky. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know, because in, in Australia right now, people can't talk about the topic. Yes, They're yes. I went on Twitter last night and you posted, I think, uh, um, or somebody reposted a story from from yourself. It was almost like a short video clip. And uh, what I read there was heartbreaking and, and uh, you described very eloquently what has happened to you from back in October with the first vaccine and, and you... Uh, having contacting a fellow doctor, I don't want to put words in your mouth. You you best describe that, uh, you know, to our listeners because they may have not listened to it. But the the story that you posted or somebody else posted, where you were saying that you were looking at the tree outside uh, the, the hospital window to give you hope, that was that was heartbreaking for me. Yeah, it was heartbreaking for me too. Um, yeah, that was, that was probably the toughest time of my life. Um, to be put in a hospital room and left alone for weeks. Uh, the only people that I ever got to see were coming in in hazmat suits and protective gear. And they, the, the lack of humanity was gone. I didn't have anyone to talk to or you know I didn't have I, 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 I was alone in a hospital bed for quite some time so yeah I did have this beautiful window with a, there was a tree outside and it was really it was just um, I guess I if I'm to put this in a positive light it was nice to have something that gave me hope and that's I guess what the tree was about really I, I I would wake up in the mornings and I would look forward to seeing this tree because sorry this is hard for me to talk about no I understand yeah, um, uh -uh. I yeah I, I I just you know it's it's amazing that you know, it, before I was in went before I went to hospital with COVID, I thought I was going to die. I couldn't breathe. Uh, I was having a lot of trouble with getting air, and my my oxygen levels were low. Um, but you know, people have been through much worse, and I don't think it really should be about me. 
my story is my story, but it's not about that. I care more about free speech. Yes. I care about I care about medical experts being able to speak up and have an opinion because I believe that if we silence opinions, then we're on a very slippery slope to totalitarianism. And uh, I'm finding out very quickly in Australia that free speech is being censored to a dangerous level. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, Australia to, to us who look from the outside, look, look pretty bad I, I you know I haven't spoken to many Australians so I I can't say much more about that but um, definitely there is an issue here because as you said you're you're pro science which is why you, you you know you follow the advice of the experts and you go vaccinated not just once but twice right and sure. um, so there's no doubt that uh, you want to follow the the right medical advice but on the other side, to counterbalance, there is a problem when we're talking about science and there's not a free flow and exchange of information, a debate on issues. And, and science is all about actually not knowing what is out there and trying to discover it. So anybody who says the science is settled, I think they're on to the wrong path. What do you think? I, I, I agree with you. I, I, I... I think that it is pretty obvious how the scientific method works. Um, and it's worked for, you know, centuries. You know, we started with philosophy, then it went on to science, medical science, um, evolutionary biology, physics, understanding the universe, understanding objective truths. Um, and the way we, we, the way we understand ob objective truths is because we're able to, we're able to have an opinion on something and then have that opinion scrutinized and peer reviewed and studied by other people and I think you'll find that most good scientists, they, they're quite happy to be wrong. Like, for example, right now, while I'm talking to you, I can see the moon. It's up there. Yeah. Like, but, but you don't know that. You can't see what I'm seeing. But I yes. can see the moon right now. I think it's a full moon, actually. Now, there could be thousands of other people looking at it right now and say it's there. But if someone else says, no, it's not there, it's over there, well, how do we know if they're right or wrong? And the only way to know is to have a big enough sample size of people who can say, no, we observe it, here it is, here are the photos, and that study could be scrutinized and looked into and the person who says no it's over there well they we can use the scientific method to show that they're wrong about that now it's very scary when that method is attacked it's very scary when objective truth starts to become a slippery slope of well you know like i'm telling you i'm looking at the moon there but you know and if everyone agrees and the um scientists or, or just the general public can see it we can make we can formulate not just an opinion or a hypothesis but we can actually identify it as being true but when somebody says no it's over there and we say, well, why? And they go, well, because I just know it's over there and I believe it. Well, that's a problem because they're making a claim that is 
objectively objectively observable and we can say uh, that they're wrong about that and i worry for society i worry for a world where people can't they lose track of objectivity and suddenly subjectivity becomes the topic like like right now while i'm talking to you if, what if i tell you i'm a cat like are you gonna believe me that i'm a cat am i a cat yeah no because because i have all the traits of a human being i'm not furry and i don't have a tail so i would say that you know extraordinary claims demand extraordinary evidence and uh if i was to tell you that i'm a cat well we're entering a world where people are actually saying well if he thinks he's a cat he's a cat that's, yes <laughs> that's 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 not that's not how science works that's not how you work out objective truths you you can't do that you like i could say i feel like a cat like like every bit of my body i i wake up in the morning and i want to eat cat food and i want to just sleep all day i feel like a cat but am i really a cat well no because you can observe it you can study it and scientists can talk about it and they can do peer-reviewed studies and they can get to an objective truth but we're in a world now where i'm worried because we're losing objectivity we're losing the ability to do that because we're allowing people to just say what they want and that's their truth but i don't think there is such a thing as their truth or my truth there is the truth you know yeah there is the truth like the world is round it, sure there is a community out there that says it's not round but overwhelmingly uh with science we know they're wrong yeah and we come to that we come to that understanding by using the scientific method and so i do worry a lot about people um losing the scientific method yeah there's a, there's a few um issues there that we can touch on them again so on one hand you have the issue about free speech that you you touched upon the other is about the scientific method and how is this being carried out in 2022 but um i also and i think our listeners as well because you have a lot of funds they may want to know how did this affect your music and your dj career because from what you described sitting in a room for a few weeks isolated almost like you have some sort of a you know, you're a leper, I guess. Um, and I can understand that the healthcare professions, obviously, they have... A, I wasn't was a leper. No, no, but, but that's <laughs> how they treated you. But that's how they treated yeah. you, the way you, you described it. I understand that the healthcare professions have to take due, due diligence and, and protect themselves from any communicable disease as, as a virus is. However, the way you treat people and how does this affect not just the body, but also the mental health... I think this may have a lot of impact to the immediate future, but also long term. So, how 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 has this affected your music and your DJ career? Um, I don't think it has. Uh, I I don't think anyone has really made a convincing argument against what I'm saying. And if they do have one, I'd like to hear it. Because I I haven't made a claim that the vaccine's bad. I encourage it for society. I don't make claims that I 
can't substantiate with real evidence. Um, I truly believe in the scientific method. Uh, and I'm not out there promoting bad science or just, you know, conspiracy theories. What I'm saying is that if something is questionable, then we should question it. And science works like that. We, we should be able to question everything. And obviously there are ridiculous claims like, like is the world flat again? Yeah. If, so, if someone wants to make that claim, sure, go ahead, make the claim and maybe do all the studies you want on it, but allow that information to be peer reviewed, scrutinized and allow it to be observed by the entire scientific community. And we'll find out the objective truth because there is an objective truth to everything. And what I, what I'm deeply concerned about is people are losing the ability to say the word truth because suddenly we're in this world where people are saying, no, that's my truth. Well, well, what have I said to you again, like the cat thing, I have a unicorn in my other bedroom over there. Yeah. Now the chances are, I don't know if you've heard of the, Occam's razor, but the most yes. simplest, yeah, the most simplest answer is the most obvious answer. Um, it's going to take a lot for me to convince you that I have a unicorn. Yeah. Um, but we're getting to this weird stage in society where if I say I have a unicorn, you might in the future, not saying you personally, but people might say, well, that's his truth. He believes he has a unicorn. So it's true. At what point is it true or is it actually I'm delusional? You yes. Know? We need to have we need to have objective truths. If we don't have objective truths, how are we going to have pilots? How are we going to have you know medication? How are we going to have? How am I going to know the 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 engine in the car works? Well. What if I say something crazy like, you know, there is no engine or there, where there is no car? Like, I don't think it's, I don't think it's unfair to say these are the objective facts and they're undeniable. They, they you, you know, the world is a globe. <laughs> that, you know, this this is the truth. The only way to work out the truth is to have free speech. And we are living in a society where free speech is under attack. Mm. Um, thanks for this. And um, I, I agree uh, with you. Um, I also wanted to know how it affected your DJ career and your music from the point of the physical disability of doing things. Because obviously, I think I've read somewhere, but please correct oh. me if I'm wrong, that you got vaccinated because you know you're playing gigs all over the globe and because of the restrictions you wouldn't be able to travel am i am i correct on that yeah so you obviously went ahead and you took that and you got injured but surely this may probably have slowed you down or made you unable to carry out those activities correct yeah there was a huge a huge part of this year where uh I, I was heavily fatigued, um, couldn't think straight, and I was unable to to be my normal self. I was about 60% of myself. Um, that has a huge effect on the amount of work I can do, the amount of um, brain power that I used to have. Um, I would say that I have it now. I, I've, I'm lucky. I've recovered. But, yeah, uh, there was a period in time where 
like I, I, I turned down a tour. I was asked to tour America and play shows everywhere. And I couldn't physically get up in the mornings without being in severe pain. And so, you know, I, I don't want to go and make a claim that it was because of this or because of that. Just the answer to your question is that, yeah, I, I, I went through a situation in which it, it deeply affected my career and my ability to, to function correctly and write music. Yeah, yeah. I mean, huge loss of revenue there, obviously, from the DJ um, tour or shows, as well as I guess your productivity in in your home studio. This this was to be expected. Now, I want to touch on something. Please feel free if you don't feel either comfortable about this, or if you don't want to talk about it uh, on behalf of other people. Are you aware? of the impact of this situation to any other DJ or dance music artists across the globe, or are you just a single, you know, the single event of, you know, this happening? I'm talking about dance music now. Yes. Uh, so, so if I'm to get this right, are you asking if I'm aware that other people have also been injured? Yes, and affected in in any way from from that situation. And you don't have to mention oh, yeah. names, but are you have you since since this happened to you? Has any other you know DJ or dance music artist reached out to you and say, "Look, this has happened to me," but perhaps they yeah. don't want to speak about it pl- publicly? Yeah, all the time. Uh, I I know plenty of artists who have been injured. And they haven't been able to sustain their their previous lifestyle. Uh, but again, I'm not a doctor. I'm not going to claim that I'm a medical expert. Obviously, but yeah. ever since I made my information public, I've had email after email, hundreds of emails of people that have suffered from neurology, sorry, neurological issues. Uh, and they don't have a voice. They can't speak out about it. And again, this is not a sob story about me. It's not, it shouldn't really be about me. This is a story about free speech. And I'm lucky because I'm going back on tour in October to tour all around the world. Oh, fantastic. Uh, good news. That is good news. Yeah, I'm very, I'm very happy about that. But, uh, you know, there are artists that I know personally that can't do that because some of them are somewhat paralyzed. Um, They've developed neuropathy and um, they've developed serious issues much worse than mine. So, uh, yeah, there's definitely something happening. Mm-hmm. Thanks for this, and I, I guess that must have been the situation because I, I, I am not aware of many people who have come out publicly and, like, on Twitter, for example, in uh, declaring their personal story and any injuries. As you said, we, we can't know exactly what, what is happening to other people medically because we know medical experts, but the fact that they're reaching out to you says something. Now. How I want to know, how did you reach the conclusion that doctors cannot talk about vaccine-induced injuries, at least in Australia, from, from your personal experience? How, how did you become aware of that fact? Well, so we have to be very careful with the word fact mm-hmm. um, because we're talking about science. So when I went to one doctor... And that one doctor said, I can't talk about this or I will lose my registration. Then I spoke to another doctor who has been a, who's a spinal surgeon who has known me my whole life. And he said, this is a huge issue in Australia and we can't talk about it or we'll be deregistered. Um, I decided to try to, I, I wasn't sure. I was curious. So I went to five different doctors, 
all who don't know each other mm -hmm. and ask them if they would talk to me about uh, vaccine injuries. And they said, well, two of them said, yes, I can help you, but I can only write it down on paper and I can't put it onto the internet or I will lose my job. The other three said, this is a vaccine injury, but I will lose my job if I say that. And when I finished that experiment of talking to five different various doctors, it was clear to me that something was not right. And then I looked up what was happening and a company called APRA in Australia, it's it's A H P R A, uh, made a a public statement that said to doctors, if anything goes against the current medical science, you'll be deregistered within Australia. And to me, that's the problem because I I do understand the need for, you know, to remove silliness from the equation. We can't have crazy people as doctors. But when you have hundreds of thousands of doctors who can't talk about a topic, that's a serious problem. Yeah. That's, that's a free speech problem. And especially, we're not talking about random people on the street who have medical opinions. We're talking about people who have seven years of study, $250,000 worth of debt in their education, and they suddenly enter the medical field and they can't talk about a topic, uh, red flag. That's a red flag right there. Yeah, it's a topic also within their field of expertise, I guess, right? So they're not talking about nuclear physics or climate change. They're talking about medicine, I guess, so for people yeah. who see on a daily basis. And if, if they feel they can't talk, I agree with you, there is a, there's a problem and and that needs to be highly scrutinized, I guess, but by the community or by, by people. Well, I also think it's important to note that a doctor knows their patient. The government doesn't know the patient. The government knows that the over, the, they have the data on society, but doctor to patient relationships are very personal. And doctors spend their many years knowing a patient, getting to know a patient, getting to know their blood panels, getting to know their emotions. When that is interrupted by government, we have an issue because that means that we lose, like doctors take an oath. They take an oath to, to look after their patient and care for their patient before anything else and they're there to help and lead with love there is a big issue if those doctors can't talk about a topic because i'm at, so 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 try to think of it like this um i'm just a musician yeah. uh but i but i have a degree in music and as you know, I, I write music for some of the biggest companies in the world, and I also tour the world as a musician. Now, if someone comes up to me and says, hey, I want your opinion, like, you know, should I use a piano in this song? Imagine if I said, I'm sorry, I can't talk about that. That's crazy, because my expertise is in music, so I should be able to talk about it. I should be able to say, well, maybe it's a good idea to use a piano, or maybe instead of a piano, you could replace it with strings. That's, that's because I'm an expert in my field. I'm an expert in music. But that's, but you know what? I'm not affecting people's health or their livelihood through music. 
So now imagine that same situation, but with a doctor. Yeah. yeah it's, uh, it doesn't sound ideal what is going on. Um, yeah. How, what advice would you give to fellow DJs or dance music artists that as you, as you, you've heard from them that they have, you know, in some way or another been affected from what they think may be um, a medical intervention? Should they speak up? Should they just keep a low profile and wait? Um, should they syndicate, oh. come together with others? What, 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 what would you advise them? Well, first of all, uh, I would never give medical advice for myself because I'm not a doctor. But if they've, if they've suffered an injury and they don't have an explanation for it, and the doctor is saying, I can't talk to you about it, they should speak up about that. Mm -hmm. they, should, they should speak up about that. If they don't, then they're being complacent. And we know the saying, you know, so complacency is just as bad as, the, uh, actually, I, you know, I don't know the exact saying, but I think, I think it's to the essence of, like, if you're committing a crime, uh, if you just close your mouth about it and you don't say anything, you're just as bad as the person who committed the crime because you're, you're being complacent. So I, my advice would be if you are injured and you don't know why and your doctor is saying, I can't talk about it, my best advice would be go to your social media and talk about it. Make everyone aware that your doctor couldn't talk about it because they were being silenced. That's all. Like, and, and that's, and, and I have to be very careful here because I'm not saying that, that means that the patient is right. Cause the yes. patient is, the patient's a patient. They're not, you know, they don't know if they're right. They, they don't know if, if, if they're right or wrong, the doctors should be able to work that out for themselves. Yeah. But, Again, if the doctors can't talk about it, then how the hell are we going to solve the problem? If, sci yeah. if, you know, if science can't be conducted, if people can't do, if people can't have conversations, if, if conversations get censored, then we're, we're in real trouble. I mean, we're, we're really in a, it's a big problem is, is on its way. I agree with you, and uh, there's obviously two issues that you touched upon. Uh, one is that um, if somebody has a medical problem and they reach out to the doctor or one of the doctors and they say, no, that's not related to a vaccine, then, you know, that's that's the professional opinion there. And, and you know, you have to respect that. But if, if the medical professional says, well, it may be, but you know, I can't put it down on paper because there's there's a problem here or my career is threatened or look at what's happening, you know, with our regulators, then that is another big issue, right? Yeah. Um and that's 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 the crux of it. Like that's that's really what it comes down to is free speech. Like I I am against free speech that incites violence. Um yeah. you know, there, there is a there is a we have to draw the line in the sand somewhere. You know, if I if I if I go on Twitter and I am defaming someone or actively trying to hurt somebody to the point where it's affecting their life, then that's malicious. That that has malicious intent. But I'm not I'm not being malicious here. And my intent is in pursuit of the truth. Yeah. So, so what, what I'm what I'm trying to say is that this is this is very simple. It's very elegant what we're talking about. It's purely free speech, but free speech to the level of 
at least let the medical experts have a conversation. And I can tell you in Australia, they're not able to have that conversation. And I don't know why. I can, I can take some guesses, but I don't want to be labeled as a conspiracy theorist and I'm not, I am not one. I, 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 I worry deeply about free speech amongst the medical community. Well, I, as I said, there, there is a problem because if, if the professional license is dependent on, on the government or an association, as you uh, mentioned a little bit earlier, then and they take the stand of I'm not going to rock the boat because I just want to continue with my li uh, livelihood. I think they're doing harm to themselves and the profession because the public's faith in the medical system and the professions and the caring professions uh, will be eroded as time goes by. And this will be a natural consequence of what, what is going on. Yeah, well, but absolutely. And, and the problem here is, as well, is that it's not the doctor's fault entirely. Like, the, 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 they have a family, like these, some of these doctors have family and children and a mortgage. They have debts. Um, so, you know, can you only imagine like finishing seven years of study and finally being a doctor and then being said, told you can't talk about this topic. If you, if you go against the mainstream narrative, you're, it's misinformation. Yeah. I can't well, even imagine that. Well, that's happening. That's, 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 that's actually the truth here in Australia. That's, I mean, I, I, you don't have to take my word for it. All you have to do is look up the, the rules and regulations from APRA. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think uh, for those who follow your Twitter account, I think you have retweeted some of those um, regulations and, and people can go in and check this out too. And I don't think this is an Australian issue, by the way. Um, if um, anybody's following news around the world, they, they will see that uh, um, even in the States, in the United States, in Europe as well, there's uh, quite a lot of measures that are taken on for professions from the regulators. To say that uh, if you publicly declare anything against what is considered the accepted science, then the, there will be consequences to that. So it is down then to the individuals to either speak up or do something within the realm of power, like like within their you know, profession, to to move things. So let's let's leave this behind, and to get back to you as a person, as Tyson. Yep. How are you coping right now? Are you back in action? Where are you? What are your plans? Uh, I'm I'm currently in my studio. Yes, I'm in, I'm back in action. Um, I just suffer from severe pain, uh, neurological pain, uh, every day. Yeah, that that is hard. I can't even imagine. I'm I'm so sorry to hear that. Um, you mentioned a tour in October. Hopefully this will go ahead. Can you tell us some more details where this is happening? And uh, It's going to be in America mostly, mm -hmm. um, may maybe Canada as well, and maybe some shows in South America. Um, but mostly I'm, I'm very much looking forward to seeing my fans again for the first time in a long time uh, in cities where they've been so loyal to me and I'm excited to play the songs that, you know, some of the songs that I've written over the last two years that are, some of them are very like positive and some of them are, are darker, but you know, uh, it's been a while. I, I, I did do, I've done two shows here in Australia. Well, during this madness, but, um, I'm excited to get back onto airplanes and, you know, on off airplanes and into different hotel rooms and playing to different crowds and meeting different people from all different parts of the country. Um, I'm excited for that. And it's something that I missed quite dearly. 
Are you playing any shows in the uh, European area or the United Kingdom? Yes. So uh, my manager is actually based in London. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's been quite some time since I've played in, in the UK and all over Europe. Um, so uh, I'd love to tell you where and when, but that announcement will happen when the time is right. Great, yeah. And um, uh, so you have your latest single, I thought that was enough. And are you bringing another one very soon? Yeah. So um, I have so many new songs uh, that I've written. I, I think one one good thing for me that came out of this, this I guess, break during the pandemic was that I spent a lot of time writing songs. They're rather emotional, but they're also, some of them are fun. Some of them are, they're, they're very different in genres. And uh, so, my latest single that just came out, which is, you know, I, th I thought I was enough. Uh, that I love that track so much because it's banging and it, it has a really, has a really strong baseline that works well with the crowd and works well at festivals. But at the same time, the lyrics are rather emotional. The next one that's coming out, um, is with an it's with another new artist that has never she's never released a song before and it's called i say it's over and um it's it's another just a beautiful record that's very different it's it's not uh it's not trying to be a house track or a trance track or anything it's just a good song with with what i think is the just the perfect amount of production mm -hmm. sprinkled in that sounds awesome. What about um, an album? I mean, your last one, Collide, was uh, 2018. Are you planning anything on that front? Um, kind of, yeah. But it's more than an album. More yeah. than an album, wow. 36 songs. Is it? Are you planning a concept album or is it a mix? Mix, um, you know, mixtape. Yeah, no, it's, it's all, all my all, all my own music, but imagine thirty six brand new records. Yeah, that's only. that's crazy, isn't it? That's a lot of yeah. music. I don't, a lot of people say it's a bad idea. A lot of people are saying, "Well, people don't care about albums these days." Uh, I think it's an interesting comeback. It's an interesting way to show everyone, "Hey, like." You know, you haven't heard from me in a while, but this is what I've been up to. Yeah. And so when I release that, I think it's going to be a pretty exciting thing. I just can't talk too much on it. Cause oh, I'm that's fine. Away secrets. W will you be including any tracks that you released from 2019 onwards? Um, maybe, maybe a few, but... I would say the vast majority would, will be originals <laughs> okay. because I, I've already made them. So yeah, I know. you mentioned <laughs> that you took time through the pandemic to to use this uh, uh, creatively. And uh, what about your your style in the album? Are you going to go back to your roots, or are you going to be closer to collide? Which which how how are you moving? So that's a great question. Both. Both. So, um, when people say going back to my roots, it's very interesting because I've been around for a while now, and some people say when they when they say going back to your roots, they mean am I going to make trance music? Yes, basically. But then, the, but then, if you think about it, redefined is one of my biggest songs of all time, and that was in two thousand and fifteen. Mm. Um, where I think so. Let me check. Uh, 2015, and so, um, so there's a lot of people that are, when they say going back to your roots, they want me to go back to the redefined style, like which is EDM in a yeah. way, you know. Yeah. So, the reason, another good reason for such a big album is that it allows me to do both. 
I can have songs on there that are closer to my very early years and then also have songs that are uh, closer to the redefined style and then also adding in a style of music that is brand new and, and the, the music that I'm making now. So, I, you know, I, I, I don't like to be, it sounds cliche, the, I, but I don't like to be defined by genres so much. I, I just want, I truly just want the listener to feel something and to have an experience. And, uh, not a, you know, not, not everyone's going to like everything, but that's the beauty of it. Like, People are going to skip songs. They may not listen to songs. They may just only find their favorites. But it's cool that if I put out a body of work that is so big that people can find their favorites and re-listen to those, and they can drag them to their own playlist and listen to those songs if they want. Um, there's no, you know... There's really no rules, and that's that's what I love about releasing this kind of a thing. Yeah, I understand why people may have told you that it's risky, but also I think it's a clever approach because of what you just said. You can you can expand yourself musically within a 36 tracks album rather than restrict yourself, and people can appreciate more the the music, and they can also approach different styles that they may have never uh, listened to or appreciated before when they have such a big uh, body of work to listen to. Whereas w when you release single by single, it's, you, you have to be restricted, I guess, to to whoever likes that particular style. Yeah, exactly. So I think we have wrapped up our discussion here and I, I would like to thank you very much for coming and taking oh, time you. of your precious you know, schedule to, uh, to come to the podcast and discuss obviously your, your music and, and the impact you have had in the Australian music scene and globally, but more importantly, your, your personal story, which I think it's very difficult to discuss and share some personal information with us and also tell us important things about what is going on and 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 your views about free speech and and what is going on out there so thank you very much for doing this you're more than welcome and i, I really appreciate being part of the podcast and if if you uh, as a parting comment if you wish to highlight two or three singles from your music career to listeners who have never listened to you. So that's an unexpected question now. Um, who, which ones would you suggest? And I'm going to close the podcast with these. Sure. So I would say, of course, my new single, which is I Thought I Was Enough. Then I think that people should listen to a song that I made called Please Stay. And finally, I think from my album Collide, listen to Upside Down. Great. Thanks very much. And uh, hopefully you'll be able to come to our podcast again when you have new music and, and a tour. You are more than welcome. Thank you for your time.